An express seminar means a lot of intense information is squished into a little uh, nugget of time. All the content for this express seminar was developed by ANMA faculty and our speakers, um, Michael Foggs and Lisa Dorfman. Thank you, Nancy, and good afternoon to one and all. And welcome to the Fit to Breathe Express Seminar on Exercise-Induced Bronchospasm. Now, as you know, asthma is a chronic idiopathic disorder, and it has heterogeneous expression, and to that extent, the variability of expression of asthma results in certain subsets of individuals who happen to suffer from asthma experiencing the endpoint manifestation of airways hyperresponsiveness, one example of which is exercise-induced bronchospasm. Now, as you know, the loss of moisture and heat from the airways, especially when the ambient atmosphere is drier and cooler than that which is within the lungs, results in a reflex response associated with the twitchiness of the airways, characterizing a phenomenon that's called airways hyperresponsiveness. Certainly, if a person experiences acute bronchoconstriction in association with exercise or even without exercise being performed, quick relief bronchodilation with a short acting beta adrenergic agonist, such as albuterol, which is the mainstay of short acting bronchodilation in the Western world, should be used. The bronchoconstriction that you saw in the previous slide associated with the triggers that induce such labile airways to bronchoconstrict is what we're trying to prevent in those individuals who have asthma. When that occurs, they have a host of symptoms which are quite characteristic for the condition, even though not 100% specific for asthma. This includes breathlessness, frequently associated with airflow limitation that's characterized by wheezing, a high-pitched whistling sound that's associated with the increased resistance of airflow associated with the bronchoconstriction. Smooth muscle constriction is responsible for this phenomenon. And there is, of course, in those individuals who have asthma that's poorly controlled, suboptimal endurance, especially when they exercise. How's the diagnosis of exercise-induced bronchoconstriction or bronchospasm made? Well, first of all, the diagnosis hinges upon a history that's consistent with that diagnosis in a person proven to suffer from asthma. There are other conditions that can masquerade as asthma, and while that's beyond the scope of our discussion, it's very important not to make the assumption that an individual has asthma without determining whether there's objective evidence sufficient to corroborate that diagnosis. The vital sign of asthma assessment includes objective assessment of lung function which ideally is performed via spirometry. But the unfortunate sadness is that most practitioners in America do not own spirometers, even though the price has come down dramatically, and even though one can bill for a spirometer and pay for it in a relatively short period of time. But spirometry is necessary to establish a baseline lung function, and also to determine whether there's any variability in that lung function when it's objectively assessed over time. And this can help differentiate exercise and induced bronchoconstriction from other symptoms that can occur in a person suffering from asthma. In the absence of spirometry, our fallback is the peak expiratory flow monitor. What does a peak flow meter do? Why do we use them? It's like a thermometer for the lungs, okay? We can monitor the patient's asthma. We can tell uh, if they're in the green, what we go, call the traffic zone. The green zone is good, yellow zone is caution, and red zone is bad. So we kind of follow their measurements to see where they are. Okay, so what we're gonna do, so we're gonna take a deep breath in, and we're gonna make sure we have, we have a nice tight seal on the mouthpiece there, okay? And we wanna take a real deep breath in, and we want to blast our air out as hard as we can and as fast as we can to see how high we can get it. So why don't, doesn't everybody practice? All right. So then we shake it down and when we measure peak flows, we do the best of three, okay? So we recommend that in the morning, 
um, when we're trying to establish a target zone, a target number, we do the best of three, okay? We do it at night before medications, best of three. And in the school, if the, you suspect that the patient is having some problems, you have them do a peak flow and see what their number is, see where there's, they are according to their target number, and we can uh, decide whether we need to give them their quick relief inhaler. And inside your boxes, um, there's a handout that explains how to use the true zone meter. In the okay, so why don't we relate the peak flow measurements to the asthma action plan. This is a key element in care for our asthma patients. Okay, so like I said, we do the traffic zone. Green, yellow, red, okay? If the person is in the, cre in the green zone, their peak flow will be 80 to 100% of their target number, okay? They will have no wheezing, no coughing, no shortness of breath. They will not be waking up at night with any symptoms and they'll be able to do their normal daily activities without problems. If they're exposed to a trigger, such as a person's allergic to dogs, they go to a, t a friend's house with a dog, they could experience some symptoms of wheezing, coughing, shortness of breath. Um, or if, they ha or if they're sick. Or outside see, pollens too. Mm -hmm, we see their numbers drop, okay? So if a person is having symptoms, they are having the wheezing, coughing, shortness of breath, maybe they'll be waking up a couple times at night, and maybe their uh, asthma will interfere with their daily activities. And their peak flow readings at this point will be between 60 and 80%, so they'll drop down to the yellow zone, okay? And if somebody's in the yellow zone, that's when we need to give them their quick relief inhaler. If a person is in a quick in a, the yellow zone for, say, two days, and they're needing albuterol, albuterol or quick relief for two days in a row, we suggest that they be seen by their doctor. Um, when a patient is at school and you assess that the patient, that the student needs their quick relief inhaler, we suggest that you go ahead and give the parents a call. If they have exercise and dose asthma um, and you give it to them on a daily basis or just before exercise, you know, you don't need to call the parents, but if they, you assess that they are having a problem, give them their, their <coughs> quick relief inhaler and call their parents. Uh, also, if they um, you've assessed that they're in some kind of distress and if, if their first two puffs of quick relief do not completely get them back up to the green zone or you feel they're in some distress, after 20 minutes you can give them another two puffs. Mm -hmm. And even 20 minutes after that you can give them another two puffs. So within one hour you can give them three times, okay, their quick relief inhaler. But call their parents after the first time. Um, hopefully, if a child is in school, they're not gonna be in, having situations where they're in such distress. Okay, all right. Well, then you have your asthma action plan to guide you of what to do. Okay, so if a patient gets into the red zone, which would be about 50% or lower than their target number, they are going to need to go to the hospital, okay? Go to the ER, they're gonna need two puffs of albuterol, 20 minutes later, two puffs, okay? And we need to get them to the emergency room. And that's when, you know, they cannot do their daily activities. They're wheezing, they're coughing, they're short of breath, they can't do exercise, okay? That is an emergency and we need to get them to the emergency room. What talk about is the metered dose inhaler, okay? So if everybody picks up their inhaler. And these are filled with a propellant, no medication in it. All right, so. If you work along with me here, what we're going to do is, with as with every meter dose inhaler, you're going to take a breath, exhale, put your mouth right on the canister, nice tight seal, and breathe in the same time as you press down. Slow, easy breath, filling up the lungs, holding for the count of 10, about 10 seconds and then exhaling. Uh, most times the doctors will recommend two puffs every four to six hours or two puffs before exercise for a child with exercise induced asthma. If you need to do two puffs, you will need to wait one minute between puffs. So you do one puff, wait one minute, and do the second puff, okay?
Everybody try it? All right. Breath. Let it out. Great. Not too fast, not too slow. Count to 10. Let up. And you're right. All right. If you breathe in the medication too quickly, it's actually going to be thrown to the back of your throat and not go down into your lungs. So you just want to breathe in nice and slow. Okay, very good. Now the next thing we're going to demonstrate is a meter dose inhaler using with a valve holding chamber. Okay, there are many types of valve holding chambers. Okay, the good thing about these is it's a one-way valve if you open it up. You look inside, you always want to look inside to make sure that there's no foreign body in there. And when you give the medication, the, make, the patient can breathe in the medication, and then when they breathe out, all, they will exhale through the, the vents here so that the medication that's in there will stay there, they'll breathe it in, they can get all their medication. Okay. There are also arrow chambers with masks. Okay, the masks we recommend for children who are birthed through about five years old because they cannot get the technique of mm -hmm. pressing and taking one big breath and holding it, okay? So how do you do a arrow chamber with a mask? You make sure you have a nice tight seal with the mask, okay? And you just have the patient breathe in four to six times after you squirt the medication, okay? You will see a new design, brand new, just coming out here, uh, that makes it a little bit easier for the parent or the school nurse to make sure that the patient's breathing in properly. Okay, and same design except for it has a little flap where if you breathe in, you can see the little blue flap go down, and that way you can tell that the patient's getting their medication. Okay, things to remember with the, with the arrow chamber. First of all, you're going to make sure that your vent is face up, okay? All right, now we have already primed our inhalers, correct? Okay. So you see the so, vents on the side that you're gonna put your MDI in. Okay, so then we just place, place the MDI. So just MDI give a quick push in it. Right in the back, okay? Okay. And it will fit nice and snug in there. Now, I heard someone's whistle. Doesn't that mean you're doing it too quickly? Yes, that is correct. That's so true. So what you want to do, as with any time you take an MDI, you want to take a breath, let it all the way out. Okay, then take a nice, easy breath in. As you're... Put your mouth on the mouthpiece, nice, tight seal. Mm. Too hard. <laughs> okay, so if you're inhaling too hard, you'll hear the whistle. And not all of them come with the whistle. These do. So that's just showing you that you're breathing too hard. Right. Okay, so everybody try it out. Okay. Okay, so if you graduate from a mask to a mouthpiece, you can go ahead and the medication will stay in the chamber between two and nine seconds. So if the patient doesn't get the med a good breath the first time, you can do a second breath and make sure the patient gets all their medication. And truthfully, they're never too old to use a chamber. We have adult, you know, adults using them. You're better to use it than not use it at all. So. of our diets and our children's diets has certainly suffered. The CDC did um, uh, a study on 9 to 12th graders assessing youth risk uh, behaviors and mortality and morbidity and found that three quarters of our teenagers do not eat fruits and vegetables. Big surprise. 29%, more than a quarter, drink a, a soda and in the study said soda pop, which really aged me. <laughs> I get it. Um, a soda more than once a day. And 80% were inactive, um, well, they call it inactivity less than an hour a day, which we know is what's recommended. Probably the largest study um, is uh, called ISAAC. It's the International Study for Asthma and Allergy in Children. And it looked at, over the past decade, about 700,000 kids who are 6, 7, 13, and 14 years old from over 53 nations. 
That along with research out of Spain and Croatia and, and other countries has shown that this Mediterranean diet, we hear so much about the Mediterranean diet because most of us at adults say, yay, we could drink a glass of wine a day and it's good for us. Because in the Mediterranean they drink wine but they also eat olive oil instead of some of the fats that, that we have, those omega-3s that we include in our country. Um, they eat a lot more fruits and vegetables. And of course they have that wonderful fatty fish we all hear about that's rich in the omega-3s. So we know that there's a relationship, at least with asthma, a relationship between omega-3 rich diets, fruits and vegetables, and this de decrease in, in the wheezing and some of these asthmatic um, symptoms. On the contrary, um, research has shown that certain foods in our diets are not so, so good when it comes to asthmatic symptoms. Those include the omega-6, which are also essential fatty acids. Essential meaning we need to get it through our diet, except we in the US are too good at getting it in our diet. The ratio of omega-6 to omega-3s is supposed to be like three to one, and we get 10 to one here. Because we're eating way too many processed foods, way too many trans fatty rich foods. And trans fats is that thing you keep hearing about that the government says we're gonna get rid of it. Fast food restaurants now have to get rid of it. Packaged foods need to report it when they have it. Trans foods is something, or trans fats, is something that we created in the lab. When in the 1970s and 80s, the American Heart Association said, you know what, those saturated fats are not good for your heart. Those animal fats are not good for your heart. Take them out of your foods. And so food companies were putting oils in their products, substituting oils. But unfortunately, if you could remember, all the foods were falling apart on the shelves <laughs> because if you've ever made a batch of cookies with oil instead of butter, you they kind of fall apart. So what they did was they changed the configuration of the fat molecule and made them trans fats and instead of cis fats, just a FYI, to make them hard like saturated fats. And so now you have these saturated fats called trans fats that are worse, worse than anything else. We know we've heard it in, in relationship to heart disease and diabetes and, and arthritis and of course now asthma.